So welcome to American Assets. Um, today I like to finish our session on calculating, approximating partial derivatives of valuations that involve a Monte Carlo valuation. So we already had a session on this and we saw that there were some subtle issues. For example, especially if you use a finite difference approximation for the partial derivative, then there is some relation between the payoff function, so the function that is uh, under the Monte Carlo integral, the number of Monte Carlo sample paths and the shift size of the finite difference approximation. So let me shortly review our setup from the last session, uh, because I will also extend the program we did in the last session to explore some new methods. And one of the methods we will explore today is the light beard ratio method, which is very interesting and which is somewhat uh, dual yeah, to what we have seen uh, so far. Yeah? So it behaves well in the situation where the other guy does not behave well and vice versa. Okay, so our uh, setup is that we like to calculate here um, a partial derivative with respect to some parameter. So the parameter appears here uh, inside the random variable, so inside my model generating the y. Uh, but there is also a function f of this random variable here inside this expectation. And um, this function may be non-smooth, may be discontinuous. Well, that is not a big problem if the density, so if you have a density, if the density of your random variable y has a smooth dependency on theta, then you are actually just differentiating this uh, density. Um, so the issue is that here this expectation operator is approximated using a Monte Carlo method. So the E there is actually replaced here by a Monte Carlo method. And now if you differentiate here the function F, so, and sorry, and, and so, uh, and now if you differentiate this expectation, you will differentiate the function f because there will be the chain rule. Yeah? So we had this d by d theta of the Monte Carlo approximation. This is actually the sum of f prime, so differentiate f multiplied with dy by d theta. Okay, so you see that in the Monte Carlo approximation, it suddenly matters uh, if f is smooth and if how uh, f behaves. Uh, and we had a, a nice uh, little setup where we can look at this, where we can compare this for different functions f, namely for f being just a linear function and f being a discontinuous function. So what we did, we looked at the linear payout. So here the linear payout is that f is just a times x plus b. Uh, then everything is fine. If you differentiate the f, it's just the a. And you see that differentiating this expectation is just a times the expectation of differentiate the y. And if the y, your model has a smooth dependency on theta, then everything is fine. So F doesn't break anything here. The other example was the discontinuous payout. So the discontinuous payout now is here an indicator function that depends on this random variable X. And in that case, uh, well, we saw that there is something uh, happening. So for example, if you stay away from the jump, so if this random variable on a Monte Carlo pass stays away from the jump, then actually on every such point, the derivative is zero. 
So your Monte Carlo integral is actually just the sum of zeros. And of course, you maybe know that at the jump, you have a Dirac distribution. Yeah? So all the mass will be there. Okay, so we had a numerical experiment uh, related to this. And we looked into the finite difference method. So where was that? Yeah. So we looked at uh, what happens if we approximate the partial derivative with finite differences. So we saw that this means that we apply finite differences on every path because we can interchange the Monte Carlo approximation and the finite difference operator. So this is just the Monte Carlo sum of a finite difference approximation on every path omega i. The nice thing here is that using finite differences is so generic. So once I have a Monte Carlo valuation and once I'm able to change the parameter with an upshift and downshift, I can calculate a finite difference approximation. But we saw in our little numerical experiment that we get a, a biased derivative if the shift is large. So that comes from the finite difference approximation. We know that we would like to choose h small to have an accurate approximation, but we may get extremely large Monte Carlo variances if h is small, namely if the function exhibits discontinuities. Okay, and we had a small computer program for that and we already plotted um, some graphs. So let me shortly show that. Okay, so we had a numerical experiment uh, and I will now continue working on this. Uh, so maybe it's good to have it again on the slide. So it was just a European financial product. So a European product just means that it depends here on S at a fixed time. And I have here my function F of S of capital T and S was given by a Black-Scholes model. So we know the exact solution you know, as at a later time is as at initial time times exponential of RT minus one half sigma squared T plus sigma W of T where W is the Brownian motion. And we investigated diff this for different functions F. So here we had different functions f. Well, the first guy was just a constant. So very smooth, very easy. The second one was just a linear function. The third one was the call option. Yeah? So it is continuous, but there is a point where it is not differentiable. And the last one was the discontinuous function. So our indicator function. Okay, so, and so that was the setup which we uh, liked to explore. And I just looked at, I assume I just looked at these three guys here. with finite differences. So now I investigate here the finite difference approximation. So let me check, is this the centered finite difference so that I do the script correctly or is it the one-sided finite difference?
Oh yeah, it's a center, centered one. Okay. So what you see here is the value of the financial product at time zero, given that the initial value of your model is S zero plus H minus the value of your financial product, given that the initial value of the stock is S zero minus H divided by two H. Uh, and you see here for this nice um, smooth function. So the forward, there is instability here for very small shift sizes. So the shift is here uh, 10 to the scale and I plot the scale. So 10 to the minus 13. Yeah, so uh, actually it's S zero multiplied with 10 to the minus scale. So you see this guy here comes likely from computer arithmetics. Yeah? So we know that we get in two problems if we have very small shift sizes. Um, this is here the situation for the forward. Then we looked at the situation for the European option. Okay, also the same instabilities here from computer arithmetics, but we saw here some higher order uh, terms popping in. So for large shift sizes, there is an issue. Well, that was also easily to understand. This happens once this pathwise finite difference upshift minus downshift is starting to cross this kink here, then you are averaging a slope that is different. Uh, and one remark that I did not make in the last session, uh, this here is the analytic solution Okay, and the distance that you observe here, what's actually that, what's, what's that? So this is the Monte Carlo error. Yeah, that you still have because you are now um, here averaging some regions where you have slope one. And some regions where you have slope zero. Okay, and it's still a Monte Carlo uh, integral huh, of that indicator function. Okay. For the discontinuous function, uh, we observe that actually for quite decent shift sizes, the result was completely wrong. Yeah, So the result was zero, exactly what I had on, on my slide. Yeah? As long as you do not cross the um, discontinuity, uh, the derivative is zero, but zero is wrong. Yeah? And for larger shift sizes, uh, you have well, a quite decent approximation here uh, of the analytic comp uh, to, to the analytic value, but at least compared to this huge instability here. Yeah? So if you if you look a little bit closer here, there is still a quite large approximation error. So we saw that finite differences applied to a discontinuous 
function of a random variable, so here it is the digital option, doesn't work well. So that's the situation. And now is the question, can we improve this? So that was discussed. <clears throat> this was the example that we also discussed, okay. Yeah, here on the slide, uh, you also have the reason why it is so bad to apply finite differences to this continuous function because it is actually a Bernoulli experiment. Uh, so sometimes um, you cross the jump and you have a large contribution, but you get this in very rare cases. And in many times you have actually zero. Yeah? So you get a fairly large number, it's one divided by h here with a fairly low probability plus zero with a fairly high probability. Uh, in the limit, this is the correct value. Yeah, So this will approximate the correct value, but the variance of this experiment is order one over h. So for small value h, uh, you get a large variance. So that is this point where you have the instability. And for very small values, you actually get zero, you get, get a wrong result. So um, the next method I like to calculate is the pathwise uh, differentiation. And the setup now works that I always start with the same slide uh, where on the left-hand side, I have this calculate a partial derivative calculate a partial derivative of uh, an expectation of some function f of this uh, random variable y of theta. So it's always the same uh, setup. here on the left-hand side. But now I will use different ways of representing the um, expectation. And uh, I will maybe swap some operators and I will be maybe kick in the approximation. So the numerical approximation at a later point in time. Yeah? And that's, that's how I can maybe play a little bit with this stuff. So first of all, um, this expectation is the integral uh, over f of y dq. And I can swap expectation and integration. So I assume that I can do this. So then I have the integral over the theta here. So now I have inside. So now I have here inside the uh, derivative with respect to theta and actually the integral. So the expectation operator is now here on the outside. So then let me just formally differentiate this function f of y. So if I just formally differentiate this function, then I get here f prime and from the chain rule, I also get dy by d theta. So very similar to what I had in my introduction, yeah, if I differentiate the Monte Carlo integral, but I did not do the Monte Carlo approximation at this point. Okay, so you see that you still have here the integral over dq. So actually you just have an expectation operator of the stuff that is under the integral. So I have an expectation operator here of my f prime and this dy by d theta. So, and now uh, I can do Monte Carlo approximation. Yeah? So I assume here that I can differentiate F. Uh, 
Yeah? Um, so if you if f has a discontinuity, then maybe you know that this here is a Dirac delta distribution, yeah, and you have to then maybe interpret the result in a different sense. But if f is smooth, yeah, so f prime is just a classical derivative, then I can now let this guy here be approximated by my Monte Carlo integral. And I just have the Monte Carlo integration of f prime dy by d theta. So that's an alternative of calculating this guy here on the left-hand side. Uh, so it tells me calculate the expectations or calculate the Monte Carlo approximation of f prime multiplied with dy by d theta. If I know these two guys here, then I can just instead of value the function with a Monte Carlo method and then differentiate my Monte Carlo result, I can just calculate the Monte Carlo approximation of this guy. Well, this here is coming from the model And this here is coming from the payout. Well, in our application, the financial product. Okay, so if you have special knowledge about these two, uh, you, can, you can use this. So if I discuss now the properties as we did it uh, for the finite difference approximation, well, for the finite difference approximation, all the guys here were green because we did not need any additional information about the stuff. If we can value the function, if we can change the parameter, I can calculate the finite difference. So now I need additional information. So I need, for example, to know what is the payout function f because I need to calculate f prime. And in order to calculate f prime, I also need to know what is actually theta, yeah? because uh, how does theta enter into the game? And since I need to calculate dy by d theta, I also need, so, since I need to calculate dy by d theta, I also need here information about the SDE. Yeah? Is it a Black Scholes model or is it some other model? So the nice thing is that this is an unbiased derivative. So it's the analytic solution. at least with respect to differentiation. So there's no H yeah, approximating the derivative. But you saw that discontinuous payouts are maybe a problem. Uh, the most, uh, the biggest disadvantage is that you need to know a lot about your setup. So we require here knowledge of the payout function f prime and also about the parameter and also here about the y. Yeah, so we need information about the model. Let's look at an example and just the example, which we also programmed. So a European option 
under the black schultz model. So I would like to calculate the delta. So the delta is the D by D as zero of a European option. So that is just here a function that depends on some later value under a black schultz model. So this is just here my process ds is r s dt plus sigma s dw. Uh, and I would like to apply this method. Okay, so this is my model, the Black Schultz model. I am interested here in this derivative of the expectation of f of s of t. And my f of s of t, so the product is maximum of s t minus k and zero, well also multiplied with the ratio of the numerators. Okay, that's just some e to the r uh, t minus t. Um, so e to the minus r capital T minus little t. So and uh, yeah, that's that's the setup. Okay, so what what is now the situation uh, for the pathwise method? Okay, let's calculate. So we need f prime. So f prime is actually well, this guy is not differentiable for S of T uh, being uh, K, yeah? So, uh, say F of X is maximum of X minus K multiplied with the ratios of the numerators. Okay, then uh, F, prime of x is, well, it's not differentiable at this point, but at all the other points, it's just the indicator function. So it's just the indicator function. It's one if x is larger than k, otherwise it's zero multiplied with nt divided by n of capital T. Well, that's funny, yeah? Uh, the, it's just the payoff of the digital option. Okay, so that's that's nice. Okay, so next thing, uh, what is um, d s of t divided by d s zero? No? So that's the other guy that I need. The derivative of the argument that is in the function f, that is s of capital T with respect to the parameter theta, that is S zero. Okay, so what's that? Okay, so you just see that here S of capital T is this guy S of zero multiplied exponential R capital T minus one half sigma squared capital T plus sigma W of capital T. If you differentiate this with respect to as zero, so this here is just the initial value as zero, then this is just the exponential of all the stuff that is inside. And this is just the same as having S of capital T, which is as zero times this exponential divided by S zero. Wow, that's, uh, that's easy, yeah, that's nice. So now yeah, the setup is the following. If you like to calculate the derivative of a payoff function under the black shorts model with respect to the initial value, then this is actually the same as calculating the expectation, so the value of the derivative f prime of the payoff function multiplied with this weight. Okay, so there's some weight. So you see, this is a little bit like a weighted Monte Carlo, where this here is a weight, and this is a modified, modified payoff function. And the modification is just take the derivative of the payoff function. 
and the weight is just the derivative of the argument of the payoff function with respect to the parameter, which you like to differentiate. Okay, so here it's uh, a little bit nicer on the slide. Um, so I have now the part that the part that comes from the model. So this will form this weight and the part that comes from the financial product. So this is the modified payoff function. And you just calculate now the expectation here of this modified weighted payoff function. And you see the differential operator, the d by d d s zero is, is gone. Yeah? It's just an expectation. Um, I have this implemented here in our little program and instead of doing everything live now as I, as I do it usually, it's maybe enough to just step through this code and verify that I implemented the right uh, formula and then we can later look at the result. Of course, you can check out the code that I present here and play uh, with it um, and uh, extend it a little bit. So let's have a look at some, some code. So this is basically the setup that I prepared last time. So we have a Black Scholz model with some model parameters, initial value of a three rate volatility. We have a financial product with some product parameters, maturity and strike. Um, for my Euler scheme, I just use a single time step. I can use a single time step because I the Euler scheme will use the exact solution of the Black Scholz model to perform this step. So there's no time discretization error. So I can use a very coarse time discretization. And here are my, my Monte Carlo parameters use 10,000 passes and some Monte Carlo seed. So I have a small function that creates a Black Scholz model here out of these parameters. If you look into this function, yeah, it's here at the end of the function. So we create the Black Shorts model, we create a Brownian motion, we create an Euler scheme, and then uh, we create the simulation that provides us with the stock and the numeraire. Okay, then I like to value different European products. So different functions F. So I just define here different functions F. So these are functions that map a random variable to a random variable. So this guy here is a random variable then. Yeah, you see it's random variable. And the first one is just the forward. So this here is just, uh, let me comment this. This is just S of T minus K. Well, if you differentiate S of T minus K, then you will get um, just uh, one. Yeah? So if you just differentiate it with ref respect to S, with respect to the underline. So this here is just the unit one. And if you differentiate a constant, well, then you will get zero. Yeah? So from here uh, to there, actually these are derivatives of these functions. Uh, then we have the call option. So this here is the maximum of S of T minus K. And then there's the function floor. Uh, so and zero. Okay, so that's the call option. And uh, if you differentiate this apart from this uh, uh, kink, you get the indicator function. Yeah, so this here is just the indicator. S of t is larger than zero. Uh, sorry, larger than k. Um, okay, and um, if I differentiate again the indicator, well. Uh, you could think that you get just zero, but you would get a Dirac measure. Yeah, so this here is then the Dirac measure. Yeah. So actually I'm just mapping it to not a number. Um, okay, so you see that I already defined here uh, the payoff function and its derivatives because here for my pathwise method, 
I need the derivative of the function instead of the function itself. Okay, so then um, I can uh, calculate the value of the financial product given uh, the model, this is the Black Scholes model, the parameter capital T, the maturity, and this function f, because you will always f evaluate f of s of t. So for example, if you just like to calculate the value, you just call this method here. So this method just calculates the value and it's not a very complicated thing. So first he's calculating S of T. So he's asking the model, please give me the S of T. Then he is applying this function, the function that we just pass as an argument and we can pass many functions. And then he is multiplying with the numerator. So this here is F of S of T multiplied with the numerator ratio. So it is divided by N of T. Maybe I close this bracket here. Um, multiplied with N of little t. So the evaluation time, actually that should be just maybe also a variable, the initial time. And then I, I return the expectation of this stuff. Uh, so my expectation operator. So that's the valuation. Also below here in this uh, code. Okay, and then I can uh, print, I can check different approximation methods for uh, different such payoff functions. And here I always provide the function and its derivative. So if you look at this implementation here, uh, it will require the payoff function and the derivative of the payoff function. So let's just check that I always did this right. So if I pass the function that is constant one, the derivative is zero. If I pass the function that is S minus K, the derivative, so X minus K, so the derivative is just one. So that's correct. If I look at the European option, then the payoff function is that here of the option. The derivative is that of the digital option. So it's the indicator function. If I pass the digital option as payoff function, where the derivative is not my own, yeah, so I pass not a number, not a number. And for all these guys, so the constant one is just the zero bond. The linear function is just the so-called forward. The option and the digital option. For all these guys, I also know the analytic value, where the analytic value of the derivative, yeah, I'm calculating the delta. The analytic value for the constant is zero. The analytic value for the forward, yeah, the linear function is just one. And the analytic value for the European option is the black scholes delta, call option delta. And the analytic value for the digital is just the digital option black scholes delta. Well, you can just look this up here. This is just black scholes formula. Yeah? You can look it up and see that this is just an implementation of black shorts formula. Okay, and I have also some plots here. Um, so here in this check delta approximation method, I then have different implementations. Uh, the finite difference implementation. So the finite difference implementation that was done in the last session when we started this project here. So the finite difference approximation is here. It is create a model, a new model with a different initial value. The initial, initial value is upshift value, initial value plus shift. Create a model with a downshifted value, uh, initial value minus shift, and then value the financial product on the two different models. So here, this is the upshift value, this is the downshift value, and then calculate the finite difference. That's the value I like to calculate for different shift sizes. So then just have a look at the pathwise method. So the pathwise method is now here. So looks the same, yeah, I just, 
I just ask you for the, why, why am I asking for the initial value? Ah, okay, because I need the individual value. I ask you for the initial value. Then I um, ask for S of capital T. Okay, and then comes my modified payoff function. So my modified payoff function is now the derivative of the payoff function. So the argument here is the derivative of the payoff function. And you see here, when I check the different methods, um, you see that for the pathwise method, I'm passing here the derivative of the payoff function, while for the finite difference, I just pass the function f. So here I pass the function f, here I pass the derivative. So if I know the derivative of this function f, then I just take the derivative apply to S of capital T. So this here is F prime of S of capital T. Multiplied with my weight. And my weight, if you go back to the slides, is S of T divided by S zero. So it is S of capital T divided by S zero. So this here is the weight. And then you just calculate with this modified payoff the expectation. And you see that there is special knowledge needed from the payoff function because I need the derivative and not the function itself. But there's also a little bit hidden here, special knowledge from the model because this here, this weight is only valid for Black Scholes model. For a different model, this quantity will be different. So disadvantage is that it is very specific, very model dependent. Okay, so maybe I try these guys. So I have the passwise method, maybe the other method, I comment it out for a moment. Yeah, because we will do the other method in a few minutes. And let me just print a few results. So he will do finite differences with 10 to the minus one and finite differences with 10 to the minus three. And he will do the pathwise method. Okay, so you see that uh, we have here the Monte Carlo approximation, the analytic value. And I also plot here the standard error. So the Monte Carlo error um, and uh, you see that the pathwise method gives you very good results. Actually, it gives you the same as the finite difference method. Okay. Except if the finite difference method is using a large shift size, because then the finite difference method will cross this kink yeah, which will lead to, well, higher order terms. So we had this in this picture here. If you do use for the finite difference method, a large shift size, so that was uh, some, some something around here. Yeah. Then you will get stuff from crossing the kink. But if you have very small shift sizes, so if you are in this region here, then everything is fine. And actually here for this uh, payoff function, since here all the derivatives are exact, yeah, I get the exact uh, slope. Um, I will get exactly the same result as for the pathwise differentiation. Of course, the two methods have a Monte Carlo error. So where does this Monte Carlo error come from? So the Monte Carlo error So even if I have here an 
analytic derivative for the slope. Yeah? So on, on one side it is one and, and on the other side it is one. I still have here the sampling of this random variable and this sampling of this random variable has a Monte Carlo error. So this is the Monte Carlo error coming here from the S of T divided by S of zero, yeah? So because this is still a random guy. Okay, so the pathwise method um, removes then maybe a numerical error you have here in this F prime, but you may have still a Monte Carlo error here in this guy. Of course, you may also have a finite difference approximation error in the other guy. Um, okay, so that was the, the pathwise method. It's rarely used because uh, you need to work so hard to get these guys here. And then it is very specific and it works only in this situation. I would like to have something a little bit more general. Uh, the next method, the likelihood ratio method is a bit nicer because I do not need information about the function f. I just use the function f as it is given, but I need, still need some knowledge about the model. Ah, okay, I still have another remark. Okay, a short remark before we do the likelihood ratio method. So for the pathwise differentiation, it looks as if it is not allowed that f prime or F has discontinuities, yeah? So F prime must exist except for a null set. Yeah? So I can have a kink, but I am not allowed to have a jump. Um, you can extend the method to also work for uh, functions that have jumps. So if you have finitely many jumps, well, then you can just uh, separate these jumps from the function. So assume the function is G, which is smooth or just has kinks. Um, and then you have a set of jumps, alpha i at the locations yi. So then you can use the classic pathwise differentiation for the function G. And for the jumps, you know that the expectation of a jump differentiated is the expectation of a Dirac delta which is just the density multiplied with the height of the jumps. Yeah? So we had this before, yeah? we, when we looked at the discontinuity that we can calculate this analytically. And if you know the density and if you know the location of the jump and if you know the height of the jump, so if you know these three guys, yeah, then you can add this to the modified payoff function and just multiply here again with this weight. Okay, so you can work a little bit and also use this for discontinuous functions. Uh, and then you get very, very nice results, very accurate results, yeah, because this is just the analytic solution. So now, next guy, the likelihood ratio method. And as before, I start with the same slide. So here on the left-hand side is again, the derivative of the expectation of this function. Uh, how was that before? So the situation is that we like to calculate the partial derivative of an expectation of a function of a random variable that depends on some parameter theta. Um, so I can write as before the expectation as an integral. Uh, so before I wrote it here as an integral over dq. So I like to differentiate here this integral. But now uh, in addition, assume that the density exists. So I do have a density, or I know the density. And then I can write here the integral as the integral 
over the density. So this is now the integral over Rm phi of y dy. And now phi is the density of y of theta. So the density contains this parameter. So if you have um, a Bachelier model, you have a normal distribution. And if theta is the initial value, then you just shift the density around. So you just modify the density. And of course, inside there's still the function f. Okay, so now let's uh, differentiate this. So I swap now the integral and the differentiation and you see that I'm differentiating the density. So I'm now differentiating here the density. Okay, so and next trick is that um, let's have another density at this location because then this will be again an integral phi dy. Okay, so let's donate a density there. Uh, if I like to donate a density there, of course I have to divide by this density. And now you see that this here is just, so now you see that this is just take the expectation of all the stuff of all the stuff in this box. Huh? So this is the function f, differentiate the density and divide by the density. So again, I have something that is the original payoff function. But now multiplied with a weight. So there is a weight w. in this expectation operator. Okay, so it looks a little bit similar as before. Before I had uh, F prime multiplied by the weight, but now it's just F and multiply the F with the weight. So the nice thing is that the differentiation has gone. The differentiation is now hidden here in the weight because this weight is differentiate the density and divide by the density. Actually, this is the same as if you just differentiate the logarithm of the density. Okay, so differentiate this function here and then plug in the random var variable y theta. Sorry, I need to do, I need to create a bit of space here. Okay, so this density function here is a function of y, of course, but it's also a function of theta. Differentiate the logarithm of this guy with respect to theta and then plug in little y equals the random variable y of theta. Okay, that's this, this weight. 
uh, and you see that this weight is just a property of the model. Yeah, it just depends on the density Y. So in our Black-Scholz model, the density of the stock as a function of the initial value. So I have just a Monte Carlo approximation of the payoff function, which is multiplied with this weight. So the properties are a little bit nicer than the previous method, because now I do not need to know something in addition about the function f. In my computer program, I can just pass the function f and say, okay, please calculate the derivative when you have this pair of function f and he do just doesn't care. He just performs a Monte Carlo and he multiplies with this weight. Um, I also, I don't care uh, how x was generated. So what is the numerical scheme? Is it an Euler scheme or whatever? I do not care about this. I need some additional information about the SDE. Is it a Black Schultz model? Is it a Bachelier model? What kind of model is it? Because I need the density. And of course, I need to differentiate the density. So I need to know uh, theta. Yeah? So it's not like finite difference, just uh, change the parameter. I need to know the theta. Uh, it's an unbiased derivative. So it's still here formulated with respect to the differentiation in analytic form. So I do not have a finite difference. Um, and this continuous payout they appear to have no problem because I'm not differentiating F. So this is a very good thing here. So I'm not differentiating F. So I do not care if F is discontinuous. Um, let's have a look uh, how this looks in the Black Schultz model. So in our example in the code. Uh, well, here you just have a summary of uh, the advantages, yeah. So the advantages compared to pathwise differentiation that I just need the density. So I need information of the model, but I do not need information of the payoff function. So that's the nice part here. No additional information of, taken from the payoff function, but I need uh, to know the density of the model SD. So let's look how this uh, method looks in our example when we look at the delta of a European option under a Black Scholes model. So I need to know the density under the Black Scholes model. So Black Scholes model is uh, log S of T is normal distributed. Okay, so if the logarithm of S of T is normal distributed, then maybe you know that there is the standard normal involved. So I know the density of the standard normal, one divided by square root two P exponential minus X squared half. Uh, and you can easily derive, yeah, I, I want to skip this, uh, the density of S of capital T uh, at the point little s, uh, which is just uh, given here. Okay, so maybe I can uh, point you to the calculation, uh, but it's really quite quite straightforward to calculate the probability density of this log normal distributed random variable. Otherwise you can look it up. So I know the density and I can also differentiate this uh, function. So actually I need to differentiate the logarithm of this function with respect to S. And then I need to plug in S of capital T for the little s. So that's the weight that I need, yeah? the weight. Uh, you can now show that if you differentiate this guy, then this weight is actually quite simple. It's just W of T, 
Well, why is W of T popping out? Okay, there is the S of capital T uh, in the um, in the density. I'm taking the logarithm of this. So I'm taking the logarithm of the exponential, something W of T. So you see there's likely coming the W of T out of this. And some constants are still involved here. So it's W of T divided by S zero sigma squared capital T. So maybe it's a nice exercise to derive these two things. Yeah, And then you have derived the weight that you need here to calculate or approximate the derivative. So nice thing, yeah, re recall again, this here is now differentiate the expectation of any payoff function, any guy from our example, you can replace the differential operator on the outside by a weight in the inside. And this weight only depends on the model. So one expectation with this weight will give you the derivative. Very nice, very nice method. Let's have a look uh, at the implementation. So you see here, I also calculate a delta with the likelihood ratio method. So the derivative is the likelihood ratio method. And if you look, the implementation is here just below. Huh? So after the pathwise method. Now here is the likelihood ratio method and it doesn't look so complicated. Huh? So I have here the weight. Huh? So this is my weight. Ah, it's a bit, bit more complicated written here because I write it in terms of S of, of uh, T. Huh? Okay. Now maybe you can you can you can uh, check this. Huh? So I'm differentiating this here. So let, let let's maybe let's maybe check this. This here is s of t. So this is s zero times exponential. Huh? Then I divide by s zero. Okay. So then it's just exponential and so on. Then I take the logarithm. Okay, then it's in the Black Schultz model, only the stuff that is on the top. And then I'm subtracting actually R capital T and I'm adding minus one half sigma squared. So you know the part that is here in front from here to there is just the sigma W um, of T. And then I'm uh, dividing by the sigma and I'm also dividing here by the square root of t, and here I'm also dividing by the square root of t. Here I'm again dividing by sigma. I'm here dividing by s zero. So that looks very much like w of t divided by s zero divided by sigma squared divided by t. Okay. Um, this is the weight then. So all I have to do is compared to uh, a classic valuation that the payoff function that is passed in here is now evaluated at S of capital T and then it's multiplied with this weight. Yeah? So this is the only addition. I just multiply with this weight and then I use the classic valuation of this financial product. So you see, I'm valuing a modified financial product. The modification is use the payoff function and multiply with the weight. So a very nice model specific modification. And you see that it is model specific here in the code because I need to know that it is a Black Schultz model. I need to extract all those parameters and then I have to find the weight for this specific model. So this part here is model dependent. So let's run now all our 
financial products. So the bond, the forward, the call option, and the digital with this method. So here I pass the payoff function and I just have this method. So I have here delta likelihood ratio with the payoff function. So for the pathways method, it was the derivative, but now I can just pass any payoff function. So let's run the program again. And we will see an additional line. So now I see an additional line and I see the likelihood ratio method. Okay, and the thing was the likelihood ratio method has no issue with um, with a discontinuity, okay? So, um, because I do not need to differentiate F. So let's look at the digital option. So the digital option, which has this jump. So the pathwise method, we couldn't do the pathwise method because the differentiation would have a Dirac distribution and we didn't know how to handle that. Well, actually we know how to handle that, but we didn't do it in the code. It just was too complicated. So it was just this, not a number. And then we had from this plot uh, that finite differences. Actually, if you use very small shifts, you get completely unreasonable results. So you get just zero. If you use a larger shift, well, then you get some result which looks quite okay, but the Monte Carlo variance is a bit high. Huh? Okay, and you see the likelihood ratio method performs really much better here. You get a result. There's no dependency on the H. Yeah? There is no shift parameter. It's analytic in the derivative. Yeah? It's an unbiased derivative. And the Monte Carlo error, so the noise is fairly small. Huh? It's a factor of 100 better. A factor of 100 better means a factor of 10,000 that you would need in computation time to achieve the same with this finite difference. Huh? This is a huge improvement. So why not use this method always? Yeah? So when we implement this in a financial industry, in a bank or whatever, I always implement the likelihood ratio method. So I just need for all my models, I need to calculate these weights. But once I have calculated all the weights, I'm, I'm done. Uh, the reason is that this method works well for discontinuous functions, but it doesn't work so good for smooth functions. And this is seen already here for the European option where we have this kink. So you see, it gives me oh, a decent value, yeah, which looks similar to the analytic result, but you see there's already an error here at the second digit after the point here, after the dot. So it has a 10 to the minus two here. So this is a factor of 10 better. Uh, so finite differences is a factor of 10 better. And uh, also here for the linear function for the forward, you see this problem. And actually here for the constant, the bond, well, um, the expectation of this one is just one. Okay, so there's no actually error in, there's no Monte Carlo error in this calculation. Okay, so this is here, um, the derivative of this one is zero and calculating this with finite differences gives me a zero. Just one Monte Carlo pass would be enough. But you see the likelihood ratio method doesn't even get this result right and it has some Monte Carlo error. Uh, so for a constant, you suddenly have a Monte Carlo error. So this method is a little bit dual. Yeah? It works good in the discontinuous setup, but it doesn't work so good in the smooth setup. So there is a variance increase, yeah, increase when you compare it to the pathwise method or finite differences. When do you use the likelihood ratio method for smooth payouts? And why is that? Okay, can we understand that? Okay, you can easily see this if you consider now, say, 
the constant payout. So the constant payout, so f of y is just b. So forget about the numerator n of little t divided by n of capital T, because in the Black Schultz model, that is also just um, a constant. So if f of y is just a constant, so I just pay you one unit at a certain time. So this is a zero bond. Then if you like to differentiate the expectation, the expectation is a constant. If you differentiate the expectation, it's zero. Also, if you take finite differences of a constant, you take up value minus down value, it's the same value, it's zero divided by two H. So now if you calculate the likelihood ratio method or the likelihood ratio expression for this. I'm calculating now here the expectation of the function f multiplied with this weight. So actually I'm calculating the expectation of the weight because you can move the constant b in front of the expectation uh, in front of the integral. So I'm just calculating here the expectation of this weight and expectation of the weight is expectation is, so expectation of the weight is the integral of the weight multiplied with the density phi dy. Right? So this is just the integral dy phi. Okay, so this is zero, but the function under the integral is not zero. If I now do a Monte Carlo approximation, I'm approximating this expectation, which is zero, by a Monte Carlo integral, evaluating here this function where the average is zero, but the function itself is non-zero. So my Monte Carlo samples are in general non-zero. On the other hand, as I mentioned, the passwise method would give me, because I'm differentiating a constant on a single pass, it would already give me the correct result. So let's have an example for this weight. Assume I have just a Bachelier model, then the weight is just the differentiation of the logarithm of the normal distribution. So phi of x is e to the minus x squared. Yeah? So I now assume that my parameter is just mu the initial value. Okay, then this is this here is my density. So apart from the constant, yeah, okay, so we have the constant here, square root of two p. Okay, so now if you differentiate this guy, with respect to mu, okay, then I get a minus two times, but times one half, a minus x minus mu times the same guy. Okay, so, and then if I divide by phi, so d by d mu phi of x divided by phi of x, I just have the function minus x minus mu. Yeah? So for a normal distribution, what I have here is just the function that looks like that. Okay, and mu is here the uh, mean, yeah? So it is the center of the density. So my density would look like that. Okay, and now you are sampling here uh, some negative values. 
some positive values. They add up to zero, so you converge to zero, but your Monte Carlo approximation, yeah, if you add, for example, by simulation, a point here will wiggle around. Yeah? So you have a Monte Carlo error. Okay, of course, there are methods where you can reduce the variance, yeah, like anti tetic sampling, where you do some symmetric sampling. But in that case, you have to know a little bit more about the problem yeah, to use the right variance reduction method. You see, in general, uh, I have here with the likelihood ratio method, if I have a constant in the function f, I'm actually adding Monte Carlo noise coming from the density. So I'm adding Monte Carlo noise. So that's not good. Yeah, also for the special case of the Black Schultz model, you can just here verify yeah, by substitution that uh, the expectation which we calculate is zero, yeah? but you also see it just from the differentiation of the constant. Uh, this setup that we calculate the expectation of a function multiplied with a weight represents a derivative of this expectation uh, can be generalized. And this is then called Malyavin calculus, where you can define these weights in a much more general setup. So Malyavin calculus then looks like that, that you have on the left-hand side here a derivative, the expectation of some function f of y, and on the right hand side, you have the same function f of y. So maybe here under the uh, expectation, but the derivative is replaced by the multiplication with the weight, yeah? the so called Valiavin weight. So this setup can be generalized, but in case where you have a density, uh, then the density or the likelihood ratio weight. So the derivative of the logarithm of the density is the Malyavin weight with the smallest variance. So that can be shown. So you can show that this likelihood ratio method has a link to the Malyavin weights. Um, but just uh, in case that you are interested, this setup can be generalized. I would like to conclude with one last thing. <clears throat> um, well, for the likelihood ratio method, you see that the big task that we have to do is calculate the derivative of the logarithm of the density with respect to theta. And we would need that for every parameter theta. So if we like to differentiate with respect to the initial value, we need to calculate a different weight with respect to sigma. We need to calculate a different weight. We always need to calculate the derivative of the density. Uh, maybe we can make this a little bit more generic. So a little bit more general. If we calculate this derivative here with respect to theta with a finite difference. Because then the only thing that I need to know is the logarithm of the density. I need to need I, I need to calculate that once for one model, the logarithm of the density, and then I can calculate this here always with a finite difference. So this is a small improvement because then I need to know the density, but actually I do not need to know what is theta because I just do theta upshift minus theta downshift. Yeah? And I just calculate the density twice. So I have another method, likelihood ratio with a finite difference on the density. And that's actually a very nice thing.
And you can uh, generalize the setup a little bit, which is then a so-called proxy simulation scheme on the level of the numerical schemes, where you have two numerical schemes. One numerical scheme is generating the values. And for the other numerical schemes, you are generating the change of the density. Huh? And maybe that sounds familiar because we have a project related to this. So for this proxy simulation scheme, now the notation here is maybe a little bit strange. I use two different schemes, but uh, you see what's happening here is just that you have here the density and you have the likelihood ratio weight approximated with a finite difference. Yeah? So this is a finite difference, one divided by two h applied to the density or it's a finite difference applied to your to your weight w uh, where w is now um, uh, just um, the density um, let's implement this and have a look how this depends on the on the shift size. So this is my last part in the implementation and then we can discuss a little bit more the results here. So I don't know, I do not have results for this, uh, but I have an implementation for this and let me just check this. So there's the last guy here, which is get delta likelihood ratio. That was the one which we have um, discussed. So, and then there's the last guy here, get delta likelihood ratio, finite difference of the density. So you see that here, this function is just the log of the density. So maybe I can check this. Density of the Black Scholes model take the logarithm of S of capital T. Yeah, so this little S here will be S of capital T. So the logarithm of S of capital T. So I start here with the logarithm of S of capital T, then subtract the logarithm of the initial value, subtract the R times T and minus minus is a plus at one half sigma squared T. So this comes here, I subtract logarithm of initial value, subtract R times T at minus one half sigma squared T. Then divide by, ah no, then take here the standard normal. Huh? So this is uh, mm, exponential minus X squared half of this. Huh? So take then the I oh, know I need to divide you by the sigma. Okay, so then divide by sigma, divide by square root of t. Okay, so this is this stuff here. Maybe I do a new line. Then take um, the square. So x square multiplied with minus one half exponential. So this part here is the take the normal distribution density. Then divide again by s. So divide by S, where is that? Oh, this is a mistake, right? This should be S of capital T, right? Am I wrong? Yeah, okay. So then divide by S multiplied with uh, sigma, divide again by sigma times square root of capital T. And I need the logarithm of the density. So in the end, take the log. Okay, and then I calculate from this function. So this is now a function that has here an H. So the H enters into the initial value, initial value plus H. Then I just calculate the finite difference approximation, which gives me the likelihood ratio rate. Okay, and you see that now I'm just valuing this weighted payoff. So you see that um, I can calculate now just 
the density and apply a shift to the parameter uh, tether. Okay, so now in this code here, I have also a shift entering. So I'm applying here a finite difference to this density. So I can look at the dependence uh, on this uh, shift. So here in the end, I have a few plots. So I'm now plotting the stuff that we plotted in the last session. So the finite difference applied to the forward, the linear function, the finite difference applied to the European option, yeah, the call option, the one with the kink, the finite difference applied to the digital, uh, the one with the discontinuity. I have these plots for different shift sizes, yeah, the plots that we looked at. And now I can also look at these guys for the likelihood ratio method. And if you run this program, it will generate all these plots. Okay, so these are the guys here. Um, the likelihood ratio method. Maybe I have that stapled like that uh, in the finite difference method. Okay, and you see that uh, maybe maybe I remove here the forward and we just have a look at the European option and the digital option. Yeah? So you see that um, the finite difference doesn't work well for the discontinuous payoff, but the likelihood ratio method works very well. Also look here at the scale, yeah? This is just a very small error here. It goes to 0.44, which is the analytic solution. Uh, and this guy here is still far away, yeah? So this is still far away, this guy here, okay? Um, but the likelihood ratio method has some larger Monte Carlo error, yeah? So also look at the scale here. So this here is, uh, a distance of 0 0.03, okay? And here it's uh, 0.02. Yeah? So it is um, worse with respect to the Monte Carlo error. So I have this numerical experiment here in the script, our description with the different payoffs. Some parameters I suggest to use for this experiment here, or which which I used in the the code, the code in this repository, and here are the results which we discussed in the script, and here are the the payoffs. So just to conclude here with the discussion, uh, well, if you differentiate just this linear function, you get a very nice and perfect derivative. This guy here is the Monte Carlo error. Uh, which I still have from differentiating S of capital T with respect to F0. Um, the same here for the discontinuous guy, it's here completely wrong. It is here instable. Uh, but here it has some convergence, but you have already higher order errors from the H. Okay, if you zoom in, you see that this is a poor quality. So now if you do the same with the likelihood ratio method, you see that here you have a larger Monte Carlo error. As with the finite difference, the same for the European option, the one with the kink, the smooth one also a larger Monte Carlo error. You see that it is very stable here. Yeah? So it's very stable across this line. Yeah? So I do, I do find a difference on the density and the density is a very smooth sky. So I can differentiate this. Of course, I get higher order terms here. But if you move to a discontinuous function, then this guy is really, really far better 
there's the finite difference applied to the payoff directly. So applying the finite difference now to the density is much better. Yeah? So this guy here is nice. Okay, so that was it for uh, calculating partial derivatives of Monte Carlo valuations. So I have a few references here uh, on Malia Verweitening or also nice stuff from Klassermann. Yeah, also in his book, you find a lot of stuff. And uh, I also did a little bit of work on this. Uh, of course, you can also look into my book, into Klassermann's book. And I have also a few papers here. Well, these two papers, for example, they have an example on how to do pathwise method for discontinuous functions. And that was it for today. Thanks. <laughs>